interchangeable parts, which we just did a demonstration of interchangeable parts. Uh, and then invention and communication. So we got some major things changing in America. We just started to talk about the uh, invention and communication where we talked about Samuel Slater, I think, yesterday or the day before, sorry. Uh, and Samuel Slater, the guy that stole the plans for the cotton gin from the British and brought them to America. Remember I told you that it was an act of treason to steal cotton gin plans from the British? So Samuel Slater was breaking the law, breaking the law. But anyway, uh, that's our goal today. Um, invention, communication, there's some kind of cool stories, and we'll do a little bit of an experiment with that. So again, it is a busy day, and we kind of got to hustle through this. Uh, so stay focused with me. Medal of Honor Monday, I don't remember who it is, but one of you that volunteered for Medal of Honor Week was actually able to do those. Okay, so, and then uh, continue working on your study guide. Your test is like one class period away. So we should be able to do today and then one more class period and we'll finish up chapter 11. And your test is 9, 10, 11, which means it's common. So uh, I'm moving into this part. Johnny, yes. I have, a, I have a bit of an issue. Of course you do. Just a bit. Just a bit. Since I'm an absolute speed demon, one of the pens couldn't handle the speed. It's kind of hard. You did not break my pen. Are you serious? <laughs> here, fortunately for you, I, like I have some replacement parts back here. You fix it here. Here's a fresh one. Fix it so there's six full sets. Okay, throw that away because you're making that. Okay, so we were here. We got to this point the other day. Uh, early industry and invention, I think, yes. And we talked really briefly about someone who was a cobbler. Who was a cobbler? Yeah, who was my cobbler in this Raiden. class? Raiden was the cobbler, and, and Raiden, Raiden figured out. Raiden. Raven was the cobbler. Raven figured out that you could hire like a, a well-trained monkey to do the parts. It's just that it was a lot of work for you to do it all together. So you basically created a factory instead of doing all the work yourself. And then with invention like Elias's house sewing machine, we make the process even easier to the point where instead of going into the cobbler and it takes potentially weeks for me to get a new pair of shoes when it's just Raven making the shoes. Now, Raven's got workers in her factory that are cutting out the soles and stitching them together using the sewing machine. And now all I gotta do is come in and she looks at my feet and says, oh, you're at 11, over there on the shelf, just like we do today. So when you go to the shoe store, there is an expectation that when you go to the Nike store, they have your size. They might not have exactly the model that you want, might be sold out of it, but there's plenty of size nines and plenty of size tens and plenty of everything because they're mass manufactured in some factory, probably in, was it factory made in China, I think? I don't know. Who cares? But anyway, uh, we begin building our own factories because people like Samuel Slater steal the plans for spinning mills and bring them to America. And I think, it's, it's hard for me because I've been through this class now seven times, I, I forget where we were. And each class is a little bit different. Some classes didn't even get to Samuel Slater. So if you're watching the video that I'm recording right now and we hadn't gone over this, I'll come back and hit rewind on that when I have time when I'm back with you. But uh, I know some of the classes did. So this guy comes to America. He builds our textile mill, our first textile mill in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, using the factory system. It's horrible work. It's dangerous work. It's unskilled work. You don't have to be very good at anything. To work in this factory. In fact, the vast majority of Samuel Slater's mill workers were girls around or under the age of 14. Uh, remind me why Slater was interested in hiring young girls rather they, than maybe they weren't adults. Doing it. They weren't doing anything. Yeah, they got nothing better to do. And it's better if a 14-year-old dies than a wife. Okay, good. So if you couldn't hear on the video, they got nothing better to do. And a 12, 10, 12, 13, 14-year-old girl uh, on the farm, and not really out helping dad all that much. Dad's using the boys for work on the farm, and mom doesn't need help doing the chores around the house. So the girls are sent to the factory where they make a little bit of money, and, and these factory girls are taken advantage of. So the main second answer was, because they're expendable. I don't think that's the word he used, but nope. if a 12-year-old girl dies, well, she doesn't have children to raise and a husband to take care of. 
So it sounds really cold and callous, and it is really cold and callous to think of it that way. But these mill jobs were really, really dangerous. So, you know, if, if Abby's working on the line and she's weaving thread through a loom and she drops something and bends down to pick it up and her hair gets pulled into the spinning mill, what happens? It rips off not just her hair, but it rips the scalp off her head. And, th and there's Abigail laying on the floor with blood squirting out of the top of her head, and, and she's dying, and nobody really cares. The factory owner is just angry because now there's blood all over his nice white cloth, and, but drag her body out of here. Because there's a whole lineup of young girls standing outside the fence of the factory waiting for work. So there weren't safety precautions, and it's not like Abby's parents can sue the factory, at least at that time. It's not like today, if you go work in a factory, you got uh, hair nets and, and face masks and hard hats and, and gloves and all sorts of precautions, and the machines themselves are much safer because nobody wants that to happen. So all of those things kind of culminate in uh, bad things going on in the factories, but it ultimately ends up better for America because we end up with larger quantities of cheaper stuff. And our cotton farmers are making a better profit because they don't have to sell the stuff to England and then buy it back. So it kind of is just a good thing for the growth of America, but there's bad things that happen with that. And it's unfortunate. And the pay for these workers really wasn't all that spectacular. Look at this. Uh, comparative weekly pay in 1825. What chump work is it? Uh, boys working in a cotton mill. This is per week. Per week. So when we complain about our wages today being too low, or if you're working at McDonald's and you're making $12 an hour, you're like, that's not enough. Okay, well, how about this? A boy working in a cotton mill, if we look at the chart here, what's that, maybe like $1.25 a week, maybe a buck fifty. Women working in cotton mills, like maybe... 250? A common laborer. Okay, a laborer is just like a worker, someone who, who works. I don't know what they do. Uh, five bucks a week. A carpenter, seven maybe. A mate, what's a mason? That's Not a guy's name. Stone, work. stone workers. So they build stuff with stone and bricks. A mason, eight bucks. How about a machine worker? Eight bucks. What's the difference between a boy or a woman in a cotton mill and a machine worker or a mason? could be dangerous because oftentimes the more dangerous a job is, the more valuable the workers are. Or are there very many boys that can do masonry? <clears throat> so the higher we go up on the scale, what can we say about the skills these workers have? The higher the skills they are. Is that true today mostly? The higher the skill level that's required, the more money that you make. Most of the time, yes. So uh, a brain surgeon probably makes more than the guy that's working at the, the window at the self or at the, the drive-thru at McDonald's. Does it make sense that the brain surgeon makes more money than the drive-thru window lady at McDonald's? Yeah, of course it does, because it takes a lot of skill, and it took a lot of education, and it took a lot of hard work to get there. What kind of skill does it require to work at the drive through window at McDonald's? You have to be nice, and you have to be able to run a cash register, and even that probably kind of takes care of it. I don't know. I'm going to guess the machine probably tells you how much money to get back. And even then, most people probably pay with the debit card, so you just stick the card in and pull it out and give them it back, and you say... Thank you for coming to McDonald's today, sir. You don't really need that much skill, but when I had surgery on my neck, do I want a neurosurgeon or the, the person working at McDonald's? Of course, I want the neurosurgeon because there's a lot of stuff going on here. So skill makes a difference. Now, when we look at these skills, it's kind of cool. I have another chart here that talks about comparative wages. And it talks about children. So this is boys. What do you think girls, if we put girls on this chart, where do you think they're at? Even lower. So if you're Samuel Slater, do you see the reason to hire young women? Besides the fact that we talked about manual dexterity and most of the girls in here probably have smaller hands than most men or even most boys. 
uh, with the ability to pick out little things like threads and needles and things that uh, guys don't know about yet. Um, let's talk about this for a minute. Uh, wages vary between 80 cents and $1.40 per week in Slater's Mills. This is in the early 1800s, depending on the age of the worker and the job that they're required to do. So even in a textile mill, if the job was harder, you get paid more. It's going to be that way pretty much everywhere. Compared to the prevailing rate of a dollar a day for an adult male in agriculture worker. So children were a, a key. Now, if we do a comparison from 1800 to today, that dollar per day, remember that's a dollar 40 per week, a dollar a day is equal to $24.70. So someone making a dollar an hour was making almost $25 an hour. That's pretty good pay. If you get a job making that much money, that's a pretty good job. Even with a college degree, that's probably a pretty good starting wage for you. If you get a job working at McDonald's and they pay you $15 an hour, that's not bad. That's going to, for a high school person, that's going to put gas in the car. That's going to pay quite a few bills. Are you going to be able to afford to buy a house and drive a new car? with $15 an hour? No, probably not. So when you think about life and, and what your life goals are, you kind of have to think about what you're going to be. If you want a big fancy house and a brand new car, a brand new truck all the time, then you've got to be over here on this chart in the, the skills department. So you've got to have something that other people don't necessarily have to offer. Not very many people have the ability to be a neurosurgeon and do operations on spines. Therefore, they make a lot of money. But almost all of us have the ability to stand at Walmart and watch people do self-checkout. And when the self-checkout machine breaks, someone walks up, sticks in a key, turns it, pokes a button. I don't know what button, but I'm pretty sure I can learn it. And I'm pretty sure all of you can. So the skill level is lower. Nothing wrong with those jobs, but that's the reason why someone working at Walmart or Burger King doesn't make as much money as uh, the doctor that did your school physical. They have skills. They have more knowledge. They have more stuff than others do. So uh, that's how things work. Interchangeable parts are uh, identical parts that allow us to do things like the experiment that we did at the beginning of class. Where does this make the biggest difference? In the manufacture of weapons of war. So yeah, it's really convenient when we're making Big scripto medium point pens because the big factory when they manufactured those pens they probably one day and I don't really know how the big factory works but one day they probably just manufactured four million lids or, or caps and then the next day they can make four million of the, the barrels the bodies of the pen and the next day they just make four million of the ink part and then they just have their factory workers assemble them because they're all exactly the same. They're interchangeable. So here's a, an, another example. When we talk about making guns, this is really convenient because during the American Revolution, every musket that was built for the British or the Americans was built specifically by a gunsmith, and every part for that gun was manufactured specifically for that gun. So the problem is, if Zach and I are marching along in the American Army getting ready to fight the British, and we know that uh, in a few hours we got a battle that we're going to be coming into. We're marching along, and, and I'm carrying my musket, and kind of clumsy anyway, and I trip over a rock, and I fall, and I'm like, oh, and I bent my barrel. Oh, it's sideways. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Which, by the way, you're probably not going to bend a barrel, but just follow me on this. And Zach, he thinks it's funny that I tripped and fell, so he starts laughing, and he trips and falls and breaks the trigger off of his gun. Now we got two completely useless guns. And we got battle coming up in a few hours. We know we're going to fight the British at the Battle of Monmouth. I don't know where we're going. Uh, we got a problem because we can't just find a gunsmith and get a new barrel. I can't just find the supply officer and say, yeah, hey, I need a new barrel because that barrel was made specifically for my gun. And Zach can't just say, I need a new trigger because that trigger was made specifically for his gun. But if we fast forward today to modern times and there's a 
Ukrainian soldier marching along, and he falls, and he breaks his barrel, and his buddy laughs at him, and he falls, and he breaks his trigger, and they're getting ready to fight against the Russians, maybe within hours. Because their parts are interchangeable, what's at the very least, what can they do? If there's not a supply truck somewhere nearby. Yeah, I'm going to take the barrel off of your gun because it's still good and put it on mine. So now I have a gun that works. You don't. So I'll just use Zach then as a shield. That's not that stupid. So I could take you out. But so the parts are interchangeable. If we have 10 broken guns, I bet you we can make one good one out of them. So uh, it makes huge improvements in life. We got some improvements in transportation. Look at this. This guy, Robert Bolton, invents a steamboat called the Claremont. Steamboat Claremont. On your chapter uh, 1911 test, it's going to ask you about these inventors and inventions. You have to connect steamboat, Claremont, Bolton. It could go. A whopping 150 miles <laughs> upstream, bless you, in only 32 hours. How long do you take you in a car to go 150 miles? Depends on what kind of road you're on, right? But three hours, maybe? Probably not even that. If you're on a highway going really fast. Uh, do the math here, geniuses. 150 miles in 32 hours. Approximately how many MPH are we going? About three miles per hour. You want to see how fast the Claremont could go? Wow. My wife would be impressed by that. If not, if she drives really fast, if she drives by, it might pull your hair off. Just the wind driving by because she doesn't go the speed limit. She goes the speed of sound, like sonic booms. But anyway, this is really fast, considering it's upstream. And it's an engine pulling you upstream instead of trying to row or using oxen or horses to pull you upstream. So this is a huge invention. This is great. This would be like uh, uh, tripling the speed that we could get semi-trucks to go across the country safely. Of course, they could faster than 60 miles an hour, but it wouldn't be very safe. So uh, this guy, Peter Cooper, he, he brings the first steam locomotive to America. What's a locomotive? A train. It's called the Tom Thumb. It's not the first locomotive. It's the first locomotive in America. The British were already using steam locomotives. Steam-powered machines are super stupid simple, by the way. Steam engines. We don't use steam engines for very many things very often anymore, but they're super easy. Let me demonstrate for you a visual. You have to use your imagination because I don't have the stuff to actually demonstrate it. But a steam engine works by taking a kettle of water and putting underneath it a fire. What happens to water when you put fire under it? Or if you put a pot of water on the stove and you turn the stove to high, what happens? It boils. What if I take that boiling pot of water? That water is angry, right? It's all bubbly. The molecules of H2O are like punching each other in the face, and they're looking for more room, and those gases are expanding. That water vapor is expanding. What happens if I put the lid on that, that kettle while it's boiling? Yeah, the lid is going to go, it's going to rattle a little bit. Or a, a teapot. You put it on the stove, and you turn it on, and pretty soon the teapot goes, with I can't whistle. It whistles because it's letting out the steam. That pressure has to have a place to go. So you take a boiler full of water, sealed up, you fill it full of water, close the valve, put a, 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 a fire underneath it, a firebox fueled with wood or coal, get it really, really hot until that water starts to boil. The molecules get angry. They need space, so they push a piston up. That piston then pushes another piston down, which after a while the steam releases pressure, which pushes the piston up and pushes the piston down, and it creates a motion like this. Then you move that motion from up and down into a gearbox that pushes it side to side, which controls the wheels on either a steamboat, the paddle wheel on a steamboat, or the wheels on a locomotive. It's super easy. In fact, when you're watching old western movies, what do you see next to the railroad tracks every time an old choo-choo train pulls into a train station? 
you've never noticed it, you will now after we've talked about this. There's always a water tower, a big wooden water tower, right next to the train tracks. Why do you suppose that is? They got refilled the boiler. They got to get it hot again because as that boiler is, or as that train is moving down the tracks, it's releasing steam. In fact, as you see in that old western cowboy movie, the train going down the tracks, it looks like there's just tons and tons of smoke poofing out of that thing. It's not smoke. Well, some of it is. Most of it is water vapor. It's steam released from the boiler. So over time, you've got to refill those boilers. Super simple. This is a picture of what the Claremont looked like. It's a paddle wheeler. So here's the steam engine. So this right here is the boiler pushing a a piston up and down, which then is concentrated into side-to-side -side motion, which turns the two paddle wheels, enabling this boat to go upstream at three miles per hour. So you can put cargo on it and move stuff much quicker. The quicker we can get stuff across the country, the more convenient life becomes. If the Nike store is in China and uh, my store is out of size 11s, then I got to win. Well, I'm wearing Adidas. If the Adidas factory is in China, and I need size 11s, how long does it take to get stuff across the ocean? <laughs> Interestingly enough, it doesn't take very long on these great big huge cargo ships. I ordered a whole bunch of uh, you know, gear bags for the wrestling club. And I got a, a thing from the shipping company that said, your gear bags have shipped. And I'm like, yes, I'll probably get them in a day or two. And then I looked at the shipping invoice, and it said they were coming from Shenzhen, China. And I'm like, oh my gosh, how long is it going to take to get these bags from Shenzhen, China to Blair, America? It could be months. They showed up like four days later. So they leave a port on a great big shipping container in Shenzhen, China. Somehow they get all the way across the Pacific Ocean. They drop them off in California. They unload them. Somehow they stick them on a truck or a train. They travel across the country and they get dropped off in Blair, America at my house in like four or five days. That's crazy how small our world has become because of a transportation. So this is also a picture of the Claremont here. That's a picture of the first steam locomotive. That's the Tom Thumb. Is that what you picture when you think of a, a train engine? No, not even kind of close. But here's the boiler. Here's the smokestack. And here you can see these levers right here. Those are the pistons. So when this boiler gets hot, it pushes this piston up, which pushes this rod down, which eventually transfers the motion into the forward and backward. By the way, if you read the sign on Peter Cooper's Tom Thumb, it's 1829 to 1830, and it's owned by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad which interestingly enough, I'll bet you've all heard of, but you didn't even know you've heard of it. How many of you have played Monopoly? How many of you like to buy the railroad? One of the railroads is called the B and O, Baltimore and Ohio. It's the first railroad company in America. It is the oldest railroad company. What's the biggest railroad company in America? Union Pacific. It's actually the largest in the world, and where's its headquarters? Omaha. Nice. Your dad works for UP. Big railroad company. It's farming. Farming changes. 1837. Now we're jumping around a little bit, but this guy named John Deere. John, John Deere Green. On Hawk Sunrise. You know how song goes. I wish I could sing. I really do. I shouldn't even try. Anyway. He, he doesn't invent the tractor. That's what we think of when we think of John Deere. He invents something called a steel plow. Plows prior to John Deere were made of wood. Here's the problem. If I'm farming a field and I'm plowing along with my wooden plow pulled by a horse or a mule or an oxen, and my wooden plow hits a rock or a stone just below the surface, who wins, the wooden plow or the stone? The stone it breaks my wood plow. Even if I have a nice field with no stones in it, over time, what happens to the size of my wood plow? It goes away. It's like if I take a, a block of two by four, and I'll picture a block of two by four in my hand right here, 
and I hand it to one of you, and I give you a, a block of sandpaper in the other hand, and I say, here's what I want you to do. All period, all 70 minutes of class, I just want you to take the block of sandpaper and the two by four and rub it together like this. Just rub it and, and to just do this. Uh, by the time the class is over, what do you got in your lap? Dust. Pile of dust. And what's happened to the size of my two by four? It's a little smaller. And I do the same thing with the next class, and you rub it, next person rub. By the end of the day, my two by four is a little smaller. And then we do that again and again and again and again. After two or three or four weeks, what happens to my two by four? It's gone. Now, if I take a plow that's made of steel, it's much more expensive and it's much heavier. But when my steel plow is going through the soil and it hits a stone or a rock, it wins. Steel, unless it's a boulder that's huge. The, Steel plow just go clunk clunk and the stone comes out of the field and you pick the stone up and you carry it over and you build a fence with it. So this is great. Does steel eventually wear down? Over. Yeah, but if I gave you a piece of steel and a piece of sandpaper by the end of the period, what's going to happen? Nothing. Almost nothing. It's going to be scratched up. In fact, it might get shiny. You're going to polish it with that sandpaper. But you know, over years, of course, we're going to be able to wear it down. But not near the speed of the wood plow. This guy, Cyrus McCormick, what a cool name. He invents a machine called a mechanical reaper. You, you've heard the word reaper before. Where have you heard the, the word reaper? The Grim Reaper. When you picture the Grim Reaper, what do you see in your imagination, in your mind? A dude with a dude. A dude with a, a scythe or a sigh. That's why T H E. It's pronounced scythe or sigh, either way. It's the, it's the thing, if you can't picture it, it's a long wooden stick with a great big curved knife on it. He's wearing a black robe with a hood, right? Can you see the Grim Reaper's face? No. No? If it is, like, there's bones. What's the Grim Reaper harvest? Souls of people. Okay. That scythe that he uses is a reaper. So back in the old days, before we had machines that did harvesting for us, Farmers literally would walk through their fields with that scythe or scythe that the Grim Reaper is holding, and they would swing it through the air. I know that those of you listening to the video can't see the motion I'm making here, but I'm swinging my body from side to side, holding the scythe that the Grim Reaper has. And as I'm doing that, it's just cutting the wheat or the oats or whatever the crop is. And then behind me, my wife and my kids, because it's harvest time, everybody's in the field, they're bundling it up into piles. Can you imagine the, the difficulty, the hard work that a farmer had to put in to do this all day long? And harvest time for wheat is July, so it's hot. It's, I'm telling you guys, our ancestors, our grandparents and our great-grandparents, our great-great-grandparents, they were really tough compared to us. The heat, the, the strength that they had to have, just the natural muscle that they had to have, but makes us look weak and soft, and we are compared to them. So we got a lot of ag. Here's the steel plow, John Deere. Maybe that's not what you picture when you picture John Deere, but that's him. Cut plowing times in half. You could go a lot faster. That's what it looked like. Nothing like a plow looks like today. Uh, here's Cyrus McCormick, and here's his mechanical reaper. So you got a horse that's pulling this thing along, and this wheel then lifts up. The blades of it appears to be wheat that they're harvesting there. And then as the horse is pulling the thing forward, it's mechanically driving a blade that's cutting the wheat close to the ground level. And then you see this guy, he's got like a rake behind it and he's pulling it into a row. So again, it cuts harvest time dramatically. It doesn't take near as long. And then someone piles it into sheaves like this where it's dry. And then literally, before we had machines that would remove the, the shaft, which is the plant material from the seed, that's the part of the wheat that we really want, uh, we literally just put it into piles and beat the snot out of it. That's a lot of work. And then we develop machines called threshers that can do that work. So this machine here is a thresher. These are piles of this wheat. So you load this up on the wagon after it's dried out, and you put it in these big piles, and then you run it through a thresher. The thresher, you drop the wheat into, and it 
beats the stuff up by itself and removes the seed from the plant material and it kicks the seeds out and then you scoop them into a wagon or into bags and that's how you sell your wheat. The problem is thrashers were so expensive that individuals didn't own them. So what farmers usually did, and you've probably seen these out in the countryside and you wonder what is that gigantic old piece of equipment? It's an old harvester, I think. But what they typically would do is uh, three or four of us, like we're all farmers, we live in the same neighborhood. So we're gonna chip in and we're gonna buy a thrasher because none of us can afford one. And then every morning when we're getting together for coffee, I'm like, hey, it uh, looks like my wheat's gonna be ready next Tuesday. And Raven says, well, mine's probably gonna be ready a week from then. And, and Raven, he, Raven forgot to plant his wheat. And Calvin's like, yeah, mine will be ready right after Raven. So here's what we're gonna do, guys. Mine's gonna be ready on Tuesday. So you all are all gonna come to my house and bring your wife and your husbands and your children's and whatever you got. And Raven, you bring the sandwiches. And Calvin, you bring Pepsi, and uh, you uh, bring uh, donuts from Jimmy Connors. All right, and you all come to my house early Tuesday morning, and we're going to harvest and thrash all of my wheat. It's only going to take a while because we got a whole bunch of us working on it. And then we'll pull the thrasher to Raven's house as soon as we're done, and we'll do the same thing there. We'll thrash all of her wheat, and then we get to skip Raven's house because he forgot to plant his wheat. And then we'll go to Calvin's house and we'll thrash all of his, and then we'll put the thrasher in the barn until next year. So it's much more efficient and much quicker, and we can save a lot of time and a lot of money uh, bagging up our wheat. Then we get steam engine tractors that can run a belt that will run the thrasher. So these huge piles of wheat are thrashed into grain relatively quickly. Compared to today, where we have machines that look like this, or in the 1950s, the bottom right hand corner. Look how small that is compared to this. Are there as many farms today as there were 100 years ago? Interesting statistic. In 1900, about 93% of America's population were involved in agriculture. Today, less than 3% of our population grow all of our food. Because machinery like this has allowed us to get away from needing large numbers. Do we have uh, a lot of farm families with seven, eight, nine kids anymore? Don't need seven, eight, nine kids anymore. If you have a son or a daughter or someone that can help you, you got someone driving the combine and someone driving the grain cart, and you can mow down entire fields of wheat in hours instead of weeks. The problem, the difficulty is, a one of these brand new is going to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. So when you see Farmer Fred driving through the field with a brand new shiny combine, I will bet you that that brand new shiny combine costs more than your house. Yikes. And it's probably only going to get used for 30 days out of the year. But it's much more efficient and allows them to farm thousands of acres of farm ground sometimes instead of dozens of acres. So much quicker, much more efficient. This is an old time video of this guy. And uh, I think you have access to it. So I'm not going to play it for you. But this is a, a guy that actually took one of these threshers from out in the weeds and fixed it all up and made it work. So I think they do one of these in Missouri Valley. Uh, there's an antique tractor place just across the river in Missouri Valley. And I think they do a threshing bee there once a year where they actually fire one of these up and grease it up and they thrash some wheat. Not because they need to, but because it's like living history. It's there for us to see what it would have been like to, to live or work on a farm 50, 70, 80 years ago. So this is the type of equipment my grandfather had to use. Uh, he was a farmer a long, long time ago. So if you have time and you're bored sometime, watch that video. This is how we harvested corn before the mechanical reaper. My mother actually remembers doing this, and this was kind of interesting. During harvest time back in the old days, they actually would cut out a stool for a week or two. Like they'd have a fall break that coincided with the harvest. So it wouldn't have been on like the school calendar because the harvest depends on the weather. So if it's October and it's hot and dry and the corn is ready to pick, the school, my mother went to a very, very small country school, 
would just shut down the school for two weeks because they knew nobody was coming anyway because everyone had to go home and help dad. So my mom remembers they had a horse. They didn't have a blue tractor, but they had a horse that pulled a wagon, and it had a, 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 a what do you call the basketball, the backboard. They had one of these on it, and they'd walk down one row of corn, and they'd grab an ear of corn, and they'd pull it off of the stock, and they'd husk it, and then they'd do like a sky hook, and chuck it into the backboard, and it would land in the wagon, one ear at a time. And sometimes they would wear on their hand this thing that you see in the bottom, kind of a leather strap that's got this nasty looking metal hook on it. Anybody want to guess what this thing is called? It's called a corn husker. So all of you that are like, what the heck is a corn husker? Why are we the Nebraska corn huskers? That's a corn husker. It's not that goofy looking hillbilly with the bimbers and the corn cob in his pants. It's this. So what do you do? You grab the ear of corn, you rip it off the stock with this thing, you run your hand down the ear and it tears the husks right off. I wouldn't want to be slapped with that. But I also think bug eater, that's just silly. I get it. During the Great Depression, we had huge plagues of locusts, which today we would call grasshoppers. So there were people on the plains that, because they couldn't grow crops, were eating bugs. A lot of people on the planet that thinks that's the next step to feeding the world is eating insects. Because insects reproduce rapidly, and they're full of protein, so, and protein. I ate a cricket once that was covered with chocolate. Anyway, so this is a lot of work. Look how fun that dude looks. Now, they do do competitions, corn husking competitions. Quiet, guys, please. Where, uh, like, this is at the Husker Harvest Days. This is a long time ago, but they still do the same thing. Uh, Husker Harvest Days is every fall in Grand Island, Nebraska. And they get together and they do old school, and uh, it gives, uh, like, John Deere and, and what's the red one? Smoke. Oh. Case and gives all the tractor companies that they bring their newest, bestest stuff and they show it off and they try to sell it to farmers. And then they have the old guys that come out and they do corn husking and they demonstrate their skills with corn husking using the same techniques that the grandparents would have used. So uh, that still goes on because we're pretty good at trying to preserve our history. Once that corn is husked and is thrown into the wagon, you will see these all the way across the countryside. Sometimes you'll see a building that looks kind of like a shed or a barn, but instead of solid walls, there's like two inch slats in between each board. And you're like, I wonder why they, when they built that, they didn't just put the boards together and make it solid. Because it was originally a corn crib. So they pile all their corn in there. In fact, in this picture, you can kind of see the corn is up in there. That's where they dump it all. And then as they need it, they pull it out. Why the slats? Because it allows air to flow through to keep the corn dry on the inside. Then they pull it out. So you got the farmer here, uh, and, and this is called a sheller. He's got it hooked to a little uh, gas-powered engine that runs the belt. Or you could have your son or your daughter or your wife cranking this handle, and he's dropping corn into the thing, and it's taking the kernels of corn off the top dropping it into a bucket. So if he knows this morning I gotta feed the pigs and the pigs need a bushel of corn, this bucket might be the size of a bushel, he shells a bushel of corn, he carries the bucket over to the pigs and he feeds the pigs. Today, most of the time we don't harvest our corn on the ear, we harvest it and then the combine takes the kernels off of the cob for us and we just put it in a grain bin. Uh, this in the bottom is the same thing as this, it's just much bigger. And again, probably, unless you're a really big time farmer, you're probably gonna share a sheller with a neighbor. So you can see here that this guy's scooping the corn from his corn crib, it's going up a little elevator here, it's getting dropped in. This thing is blowing all the cobs over into this pile, and then the corn itself is drop, dropping out of this little thing, and coming up here and probably dumping into a wagon. So much more efficient. We keep developing machines that allow us to get better at what we do. 
a combine that harvests corn today is better than a combine that harvests corn 20 years ago. Way better than one that harvested corn 40 years ago. They get bigger, they get faster, they get more efficient. So farmers can farm more land in less time. So eventually we'll end up with many fewer farmers because of that. Uh, here's a video of a sheller actually working. I don't know if I can get it to play from here. This is actually kind of a cool one here. Uh, but what time does this class get out? 16. Okay, we got time to watch because this this is how a sheller works. And I'll FF a little bit of it, I'll fast forward a little bit of it. Because we don't need to see all of it. It's got a little gas engine running it. You can see that there's the option of using a hand crank if you choose. Only problem with that. You better be careful how far into that thing you stick your hand. But uh, that's pretty efficient. Or you don't want to get your belt caught in that wheel that's slinging by you fast either. Now, compared to today's equipment, not even a little bit efficient. This is uh, combining corn in 2018. It says we have a, an error in the video, but. Um, you guys have seen this before anyway. It's not something new to you because we live in Nebraska, so you've all seen combines go by and, and pick corn. Now, this is a good story. This is uh, a man named Samuel Morse. What is Samuel Morse famous for? Morse code. And what is Morse code? Dots and dashes used for what? Could use it for secret messages. Morse code is actually an international language, so there's not any secret to it. But he comes up with this series of dots and dashes that we can send an electrical pulse across a power line from community to community. This is transformational. It's sort of uh, like going from a telephone to a telephone to a cell phone. With a telephone, when I was your age, uh, the only way to get a call is to be at home waiting for a call. Now, if somebody wants to get a hold of us, you know, they can within minutes. If I, if I challenged any one of you to get a hold of your parents, uh, what do you think the, the, if you had your phones in your hand? How long do you need to take? Ten seconds, right? You, they're on your speed dial. You click, hey, what's going on? So yeah, it doesn't take very long at all. This thing wasn't quite as fancy as your cell phone, but here's the idea. If you look at the little gizmo down in the bottom, we have two electrical wires connected to it. Now, in between, so there'll be one wire connected to this side right here, and one wire connected to this side right here. Now, while this lever is up, notice that there's a gap in between. Once I push that lever down, what happens to that gap? It connects a circuit. Once the circuit is connected, electricity can flow from this wire up through here through this wire. While there's a gap there, electricity can't flow. It's the same thing that's going on in this light switch in the wall right here. As, as the light is off, there's a gap in this switch. So there's a wire that's coming down this way, and probably up this way, and then up this way to the light. Right now, there's a gap in between those wires. But if I flip the switch, what happened to that gap? It closed. So electricity is now flowing through it. If I do this, no electricity is flowing through it. So Samuel Morse came up with this genius idea to send messages like this. The dots and the dashes were a simplified version of letters, actually a, kind of a difficult version of letters. So a dot is like really quick. So if I'm flipping the light switch, a dot would be like, barely comes on. A dash would be a little bit longer. And it would take a little bit of time for you to learn this language of uh, electricity, but here's how it basically works. Before we have the telegraph, 
the only way we could send messages was the postal service and then maybe across Nebraska later like the Pony Express which was really really quick but if I want to send a letter to my brother dear brother I hope you had a Merry Christmas oh and my brother lives in Kearney how long do you think from the Blair post office to my brother's house two days probably maybe a day but probably two days uh, Morse code works like this. I go to the telegraph office in Blair, and I say, I'd like to send a message to my brother in Carney. Okay, what would you like to say? By the way, they charge you by the letter. So instead of, dear brother, I hope you had a Merry Christmas, you cut out all the vowels. Because you can still read words without the vowels. Nobody ever can read words without the vowels. Try that sometime. Type a sentence with no vowels. It'll mean the same thing. So I don't want to pay. So I'm cheating. I'm like, dear brother, I hope you had a Merry Christmas. Uh, love, uh, your brother. So I, I give it to the telegraph operator, and he uses this new uh, uh, alphabet. He goes, beep, 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 beep. And it sends this electrical message across a wire, and it gets all the way to Arlington. And once it gets to Arlington, the telegraph operator decodes it. He's like, no, oh, it's supposed to go to Carney. So he sends a message, beep, 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 beep. And it goes to Fremont, and the guy in Fremont is supposed to go to Carney. Beep, beep, beep. And pretty soon it gets all the way to Carney. Really quickly. Then the telegraph operator in Carney is like, oh, this is supposed to be here. So he decodes the message. He writes it on a piece of paper. Now he's got to get it from the telegraph office in Carney to wherever my brother is. So I kind of have an address on it, too, just like a, a piece of mail. So outside the telegraph office, especially in the summertime, we're always young boys. Didn't have anything better to do. So they sit outside the telegraph office. I'm the telegraph operator. I walk out and I'm like, hey, Zach, uh, can you take this to uh, Mr. Bellamy's brother? And Zach's like, sure. So Zach uh, gets on the, uh, and they have a bicycle. Zach takes off on a sprint as fast as he can. He goes and he finds my brother and he says, are you Mr. Bellamy's brother? And my brother says, well, yes, I am. And he delivers the message. So how long did that take? Maybe minutes, depending on how far we're going. If we're going across the country, it might take a day because that's a long ways to relay that message. And sometimes it can get messed up, but it doesn't take very long. So Zach's like, do you have a message you'd like to reply? And my brother's like, oh, that's very nice. And my brother goes, well, yes, I do. And Zach knows how much it costs, so he writes down the message, and he goes, I think that's going to be 17 cents. And my brother goes, okay, perfect. And he gets out a quarter, and he gives it to Zach. Why did he Why are all those boys hanging around the telegraph office? It's a way to make money. They're not paying Zach to deliver the messages, but Zach gets the tip. So Zach pays 17 cents to send my telegram. He gets uh, eight cents back. That's his tip. He goes to the store and buy a piece of candy, something like that. So this is how it works. Here's the tricky part. All of us hear the word Samuel Morse, and I think most of you probably thought Morse code right away. Here's the story. Samuel Morse did not invent Morse code. Sure. This guy is not a nice man. He looks like a Santa Claus. With, but in fact, really, though, what kind of a jerk wears a suit with all these medals on? What did he get these for anyway? Did he win the turkey trot in the third grade so he got a medal? Most of you probably have medals from winning something or participating in something, but you don't wear them to school every day. That's an old man anyway. So here's the thing. He's a grouchy old man. He's developed this genius system, but he doesn't have enough money to make it a thing. Because it's going to cost a lot of money to string electrical wire all the way across the country. Uh, so he starts going to places where there are people that have money. And he's visiting mostly colleges and universities. And he's giving speeches, and everyone's like, oh, that's a great idea. But he isn't finding investors. One day he's giving a speech at a college, and there's a young man in the audience named Alfred Vail. And Alfred Vail is like, this is amazing. So after the speech, he goes to Samuel Morse and he says, Sir, I got some ideas. I think I know how we can fix your code. I just told you Samuel Morse is a jerk. Do you think he wants a young college student telling him how to fix what he thinks is perfect? He says, kick rocks, you punk. I don't want to hear from you. My code's perfect as it is. And then Alfred Vail says some magic words. My father has a lot of money. And Samuel Morse goes, oh, really? What ideas did you have? 
here's the problem with the original Morse code when Samuel Morse wrote it. There was a series of dots and dashes that represented every word in the alphabet, or every word in the English language. So you needed a dictionary, and a telegrapher, someone who operates this machine, would have to memorize a dictionary of words. It would be worse than learning a totally different language. It would be more difficult. So Vail says, why don't we, instead of assigning dots and dashes to every word, Assign dots and dashes to every letter, because then you only have to memorize the letters of the alphabet. And Vail was like, okay. So he, ma he makes a deal with Morse for part of his company. Now, Alfred Vail is the inventor of Morse code, uh, but he gets almost nothing out of it. He needs to make sure everyone has his blue sheet. He gets almost nothing out of it. So Alfred Vail, he's the man. Are you ever in your life going to need to know that? I don't think so. I just filled your brain with a little bit of useless knowledge, but it's kind of a cool story. Uh, should we try it? I think we should. So when we play Morse code, it, it's going to sound like a beeps. So I'm going to play some Morse code for you, and then we're going to try to decode a Morse message. Okay, I'm going to freeze it. All right, I got a Morse message somewhere along here. You're going to need it. Okay. I don't know. I'm not looking at the same sheet as you. This is what uh, Morse code sounds like. So, I just sent you a message. All right, nobody got that. because but Can you tell the, a little bit of a difference between a dot and a dash? Thank you. A little bit? Okay. Uh, Morse code looks like... Not that. Wrong one. Morse code looks like this. So, you guys are purple one. What I'd like you to try to do is to see who can decode this message the quickliest. A slash separates words. So you're looking at dots and dashes, and every time there's a slash, it's a different word. I got a dumb, dumb sucker for the winner, whoever's quickest at getting the quickest. And you have to have it written down. So do your best to try written or type. You have to figure it out. And you can't cheat, so don't go into Google and look up Morse code translator and just type in dots and dashes. You actually have to do it. And don't write on my blue sheet because I need those back. If you've written on it, that's fine. Just erase it. Every class has a different message anyway. But I'm picking those up, so write it on scratch paper or in your agenda or something. Winner gets a dumb dumb I'll even let you pick your flavor of dumb dumb sucker. And everybody loves dumb dumb, so don't pretend you don't care. You're just doing purple one. You don't need to do purple two or purple three or purple four. Just purple one. Pretty fast. I don't know if they get you catch me. Pretty fast back here too. Now some people on the third word, maybe starting the fourth word. You guys are pretty good at this, actually. Kind of frustrating, but if you memorize the alphabet, you probably could fly through this. Yeah, 
Yeah, sometimes once you get the first couple letters, it's just kind of multiple. And then once you start seeing the sentence come together, it really makes sense. And it's pretty easy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Lady's got it. We'll wait for a second. We'll do two places. We'll wait for a second place. So keep going. How about maybe I need to ask Blaney, do you believe that statement to be true or false? I think so too. Take your flavor. You suck up. Did you get it too? And we got second place right here. And you don't even know who you're talking about, but just say true. Okay. Uh, the answer is Nate got caught picking his nose. How many of you got through what uh, Nate got caught at least? All right, I'll say I'll say you guys did a fantastic job. Now I do need those blue sheets back, so if you would please uh, pass them maybe to the front of the row, that might be the easiest thing for us to do. So you guys mastered Morse code already, pretty easy. moved to southern Texas, southern Texas cotton country. So the, I stopped by one time when I was visiting a cotton field, and I stole this cotton. I'm just kidding. Actually, this had blown to the edge of the field in a windstorm, so I didn't really steal it. I just picked up the trash, so I just got a Walmart sack or whatever this is and put some cotton in it. But uh, this is what raw cotton looks like. It's dirty. It's kind of gross. Uh, this is what it looks like on the plant. This is a cotton bowl. They used to be together, but this is probably 15 or 20 years old, so it's fallen apart and it's really dry and brittle. But the problem is, one, this plant is prickly. In fact, look at that. It looks like a cat claw sticking off of the end of it here. Can you imagine picking this tens of thousands of times a day? That little sucker is going to get up underneath your fingernail or under your cuticle. But here's the real problem with cotton that makes it very labor intensive. Just in this little chunk of cotton right here, I feel one, two, three, four, at least five seeds. And to get a seed out of this chunk of cotton, it's hard. So what they had to do before they have a cotton gin, and I'll let you touch the cotton sometime, is they had to take uh, two cards with little teeny tiny needles on it, and they brush it. Good job today. Sorry I didn't get as far as I wanted to, but you guys are very patient, and I appreciate your patience. Uh, 